There are two distinctly different ways to add water to a triple bond. But when the compound you're starting with is a terminal alkyne, they give two distinctly different products. Take a look. The conditions I show here are very similar to conditions used to add water to an alkene. The difference is because the triple bond is less reactive toward electrophilic addition, we use a mercuric sulfate catalyst along with water and sulfuric acid. And look at the surprise. The product does not have an OH in it. It's a ketone. When you look carefully, you'll see that we've added hydrogen to the carbon that already has the most hydrogens. The addition follows Markovnikov's rule. Just as a quick reminder, Markovnikov's rule says that the hydrogen adds to the alkene or alkyne carbon having the greater number of hydrogens. The mechanistic version of Markovnikov's rule states that the electrophile adds to the carbon that leads to forming the more stable intermediate. So this is the more general rule that talks about electrophiles, not just hydrogens and it actually refers to an explanation regarding the region selectivity. The more stable intermediate is formed. Okay, back to adding water to alkynes. Using a very different reagent, borane followed by an oxidizing agent, we can add water to the triple bond with anti-Markovnikov region selectivity. The hydrogen from the borane adds to the carbon that has less hydrogens, and the oxygen adds to the carbon that is less substituted. So the product in this case is an aldehyde, not a ketone. But in both cases, the products have a carbonyl group, not an alcohol. To understand the reason for the formation of ketones and aldehydes, we'll take a look at the mechanisms of the reaction. What you see here is the steps we would write for the standard electrophilic addition of water to an alkyne. We would expect protonation of the pi bond to make a carbocation that added water as a nucleophile. This would leave a protonated hydroxyl group with a positive oxygen, and loss of a proton would make product. While this mechanism makes sense, it's a simplification of what really happened, because the vinyl carbocations are high-energy, unstable intermediates that are formed only very slowly under these conditions. Furthermore, this mechanism doesn't account for the fact that mercuric sulfite catalyzes the reaction. Remember, the real reagents we have in this reaction flask are the hydronium ion and the mercuric ion. Of course, we also have water. While the mechanism of this reaction is considered to be complex and perhaps not perfectly understood, we can write a simple version that's reasonably accurate. The mechanism needs to take into consideration the fact that mercuric ion increases the rate of this reaction. The mechanism needs to show water adding while the mercuric ion remains bonded to the other vinyl carbon so we don't make a vinyl carbocation. And thirdly, a proton will have to be lost from water while a mercuric ion is being replaced by a hydrogen. All this is accommodated by writing the following mechanism. We picture the pi electrons bonding with the mercuric ion, while a nucleophile, water, adds to the more substituted carbon. This forms an intermediate with mercury bonded to one of the vinyl carbons and water added to the other. The oxygen is protonated and needs to lose a proton. Water can accept the proton, leaving the electrons with the hydroxyl group. And the electrons bonding to mercury can bond to a proton from the hydronium ion. This leads to the product I've shown here. Mercuric ion is released. The hydronium ion is released. Both of these ions are simply catalysts in the reaction. The reactants that are consumed are the alkyne and water. The product I've written here is an enol. It gets its name from the fact that it's an alkene and an alcohol. And it doesn't look anything like the ketone that I said is the actual product. Enols are converted in an equilibrium reaction to carbonyl compounds. Take a look. The equilibrium I'm talking about converts an enol, like I've shown on the left, into a ketone. Although it's an equilibrium, the equilibrium vastly favors the carbonyl compound, the ketone in this case. A hydrogen is removed from this oxygen, and a hydrogen is added to this carbon. The process of converting an enol to a ketone is known as tautomerization, and because in this case the equilibrium involves a ketone and an enol, it's called keto-enol tautomerization. 
Under the acid conditions of the reaction that I've shown you here, the mechanism looks like this. The pi electrons bond with the proton from the acid. This is simply electrophilic addition, isn't it? And in the second step, water accepts a proton from the oxygen. And these electrons form the pi bond of the carbon-oxygen double bond. Notice that the proton that ends up in the molecule isn't the one we started with. The one we started with is lost to water. The one that ends up in the molecule comes from the hydronium ion. In any case, it's a rather simple two-step in, in any case, it's a rather two-step process that we envision. Protonation of the alkene and loss of the proton. This means, in effect, that any hydration reaction that makes an enol, like I've shown here, is a reaction that makes a ketone as a final product. When you start with a terminal acetylene, you make a methyl ketone. There's the product. Let's look at the other reaction that adds water to alkynes. These are the exact reaction conditions that we learned for adding water to alkenes. For the reaction with alkenes, and especially for the reaction with terminal alkynes, we often use a reagent that's not borane itself, but rather a substituted borane. When we have alkyl groups attached to the boron, it prevents additional reaction to the product we're making. In any case, the reaction mechanism looks a lot like the one we wrote for the reaction with alkenes. You picture use of a pair of pi electrons to form a bond with boron, and as that's happening, a hydrogen with a pair of electrons forms the bond with the carbon. In a single step, we add both the hydrogen and the boron to the pi bond. And then in an oxidation step, we convert that to an enol. Without going through the mechanism of this oxidation step, let me just remind you that it involves a peroxide anion acting as a nucleophile to react with boron. And ultimately, the oxygen from the peroxide ends up on carbon. Again, the product is an enol. And again, the ultimate product is a result of tautomerization to make an aldehyde. It's an aldehyde this time instead of a ketone because we have a hydrogen on that carbon. This is a terminal acetylene. So there's a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, and a hydrogen in the product. Under basic conditions, the arrow pushing for the tautomerization equilibrium is a little different. You picture a hydroxide removing from this hydroxyl group, these electrons remaining to form the carbonyl double bond, and these pi electrons being protonated, taking a proton from water. That regenerates the hydroxide so hydroxide is a true catalyst. And we're also regenerating water, so water isn't consumed either. This is simply a rearrangement. The hydration of alkynes using borane is essentially a way to make aldehydes. So, in summary, back to the beginning. A terminal alkyne will add water using sulfuric acid, water, and mercuric sulfate to make a ketone. Using a borane-reducing agent, generally a dialkyl borane reagent. Hydration leads to the formation of aldehydes. These are valuable reactions for making methyl ketones and aldehydes, and the reactions make alkynes important intermediates in organic synthesis.